stay away, stay away from the major sins. Ignore the whispers of the Shea tent. Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls. Stay away, stay away from the major sins. Ignore the whispers of the Shea tent. Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of Soul Reflection I'm your host Abu Abdis Salam We're going to start a new disease of the heart or the soul and we're going to talk about love of this world Now Wealth in and of itself, is it something bad or is it something good? In fact, wealth intrinsically is neither good nor bad. It could be either. It depends on how the person uses this wealth. Wealth is merely a facilitator for good or evil. It could be both. It's a tool. And it really depends on the person's conduct pertaining to wealth, whether he should be praised or whether he deserves blame. So, for example, if he is too extremely eager for wealth, if he spends it in an unlawful manner, if he gets it, acquires it in an unlawful manner, if he withholds it when it should be spent or if he shows off proudly, then these are the things that are prohibited with regards to wealth. One might ask a question, for example, okay, is it, you know, showing off or if somebody's got a really expensive car or he's got an expensive garment or something of that nature, is he blameworthy for that? In actuality, Islam does not prohibit that. Islam does not prohibit someone from getting a really nice expensive car or an expensive garment. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that it has been beautified for man, the love of, and he mentions a number of things. And from among those things, Allah mentions the love of wealth, the love of gold and silver, hordes of it. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has beautified and made this as part of one's fitrah, that he loves gold and silver, he loves wealth in general. Now, the problem comes if somebody spends beyond his means. Maybe he has a monthly salary of 1,000, 1,000 pounds or euros or dollars or whatever that is. But then he buys a garment of say 5,000 pounds, euros, dollars, whatever. So here this may be considered to be israf or extravagance. Extravagance differs from person to person and place to place. For one person, this might be extravagance. For another person, that same thing is not considered extravagance. Why? Because it is within his means to do so. For a person who has, you know, five million in his account, then in such a case, it's perfectly fine for him to buy, for example, a garment costing a thousand dollars. But for somebody whose monthly salary is five hundred dollars, then he shouldn't spend so much maybe on a garment. But it differs from person to person. It depends on his saving. It depends where he lives. So one cannot immediately look at somebody else who is rich and say, oh, that is extravagance. Look, he's got such an expensive car or an expensive garment or something of that nature. Umar radiallahu anhu would see the conquests in his time. And this would lead him to cry because the Muslims had conquered a lot of land and a lot of wealth had come to the Muslims at that time. So he used to cry and say, Allah did not withhold this these conquests from the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr anhu for any harm that he intended for them both and then give them to Umar for some good that he intended for him. 
he recognized that this wealth that is coming to the Muslim land is a great test. In fact, Yahya ibn Mu'adh, rahimahullah, he says, wealth is like a scorpion. If you are not good at averting its harm, then do not take it. Because if it stings you, then its poison will kill you. It was said to him, how can we avert its harm? He replied by obtaining it lawfully and spending it legitimately. So this is the crux of the matter. Sufyan, rahimahullah, another great scholar from the early Muslims, he says that wealth in our time is a weapon for the believer. Not a weapon against, a weapon for the believer. So you get a balanced understanding from the early Muslim scholars. On the one hand, it's a test. Be careful, you know, realize it's a test. On the other hand, you can use it for good. And you should use it as a weapon for the believer. Wealth is merely a means where one might assist his worldly and or religious affairs. To this effect, we have a statement from Saeed ibn al-Musayyib. A tabi'i rahimahullah who said, There is no goodness in a person who does not wish to accumulate wealth lawfully so that he may protect himself from begging from people so that he can keep good relations with his kith and kin and give out its dues. In other words, by paying charity from zakah. So he's saying, Sayyid ibn Musayyib is actually saying that you should want to have wealth. But you should obviously take it in a lawful manner and spend it on good, worldly, as well as religious things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ himself said, Two hungry wolves sent to some cattle are not as destructive to the cattle as a person's extreme eagerness for wealth and status is to his religion. So wealth and status, if a person is eager for them both extremely, then this could damage his religion and it's very very dangerous so is wealth a curse or is it a blessing it's like a matchstick you can use it to burn yourself or you can use it to light a fire and feed yourself from this in other words cook something if wealth is used lawfully it is considered to be praiseworthy in fact this is especially the case if you use that wealth to do good deeds for example you give in charity you spend on your family, you spend on yourself with the intention of facilitating worship. So for example, if a person buys a nice expensive car and he does that with the intention that Allah will make it easy for him to go to the masjid or go to religious lectures or something of that nature, then he will actually be rewarded for buying that expensive car. In fact, who is the most richest person to have ever lived on this planet? It is none other than Sulaiman salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a kingdom. Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah gave him a kingdom which no one has ever had before him and no one will ever have after him. So here you can see Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was the richest person, but he was a prophet. And so nobody in this dunya alive today, no scholar, no religious person, no mujahid, nobody reaches the level of Sulaiman alayhi salam because he's a prophet. You can't get higher in status than a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, he wanted a kingdom of wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him, but he acquired it lawfully. He spent it in a lawful manner. He gave its due, gave its charity and so on and so forth. He spent it on his family, etc. He did not withhold it. He did not show off proudly with his wealth. So in this way we understand that wealth could be good or it could be bad. And indeed the majority of the people of Jannah are the poor people. Why? Because wealth is such a difficult tool to manage. Its harms are very easy to fall into. And we'll talk about that shortly inshallah. Now let's talk about some of the benefits of wealth. Now obviously the worldly benefits, they are obvious. You know, to eat, drink and you know, clothe yourselves and buy you know, niceties and trinkets and what have you. We know about the worldly benefits of wealth. But let's talk about some of the religious benefits of wealth. Why should one try and get wealth lawfully? Well, let's take some examples. The religious ones are restricted to three forms. Number one, wealth that facilitates worship. 
So this is when a person spends on himself in order to complete certain acts of worship that are required of him, such as jihad, such as umrah, such as hajj. He has to spend on this. Even things like salah, he has to spend on getting water so that he may make wudu. So these things are wealth that facilitates his own worship. Even if a person eats and drinks so that he has strength to worship Allah, so that he has strength to wake up at night, for example, to make the night prayer. Or for example, he gives money in charity and so on and so forth. So wealth that facilitates worship, that helps you to do worship, wealth that you spend on yourself in order to aid you to do worship. Number two, wealth that is spent on others. Okay, so we're talking about the benefits of wealth, the religious benefits, not the worldly benefits, the religious benefits. Number two, wealth which is spent on others. So here this is wealth that a person spends on others and this includes things like giving charity. It includes hospitality. If you have a guest, for example, you look after your guest and you get rewarded for this because the Prophet ﷺ encouraged this. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيُكْرِمْ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him be generous to his guest. So Allah has connected this. He has linked generosity to one's guest to Iman. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day. Number three, for example, to safeguard one's honor. And number four, for example, wages for hiring someone and so on and so forth. The third type of benefit is wealth utilized for public benefit. So this is wealth that you spend in order that the general public may benefit from that. So this could be, for example, safeguarding a public interest such as constructing a masjid, building a masjid. Imagine if you spend money and build a masjid, you get the reward of every single salah that is prayed in there. Every gathering of knowledge, for example, or somebody's reading Quran, you get the reward of all of that that happens in that masjid. Constructing masajid, constructing bridges, for example, so people can go over, as well as eternal endowment. So these are some of the benefits of wealth, the religious benefits. After the break, inshallah, we're going to be talking about some of the harms of wealth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala man bu'itha rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about wealth and some of its religious benefits. Let's now have a look at the harms of wealth. And the harms could be of a number of different types. Harms to one's religion. Number one, wealth that leads to disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is wealth that leads a person to commit acts of isyan or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against Allah. And this is because wealth comes with increased access to things that a person might not normally be able to do. So for example, if a person has wealth, then he has the ability to fall into more sins. So for example, he's able to do gambling. He's able to experiment in illegal substances. Maybe he has money to go out and commit zina, so on and so forth. So wealth comes with a lot of access to a whole lot of sins that a poor person might not be able to do. So this is, again, one of the harms of wealth. Number two, wealth that is spent on lawful things that become addictive. In number one, we looked at things which are haram and wealth gives you access to that. Number two, looking at things which are normally halal, they're lawful, they're allowed in Islam, permissible. But a person, he gets addicted to these things. So for example, when these things become outside of his control, he's addicted to these things. For example, a person might love shopping or he might love wasting time and money on permissible entertainment. So for example, he has money, he can buy lots of games, he can buy you know, lots of things in the shopping malls and so on and so forth. This type of wealth is diverting him, is what? What is this type of wealth doing to him? It's making him addicted to those pleasures which are normally halal, but because of his addiction, they are on the border of haram, if not haram itself. 
Finally, wealth that distracts a person from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, very dangerous. This is a very, very dangerous type of wealth. And it is truly evil because the dhikr of Allah, or the remembrance of Allah is the very essence of worship. And we have been created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this could be wealth that is spent on things that occupy both the person and his time, regardless of whether that activity engaged in is reprehensible, or whether it's prohibited, or whether it is permissible. So a person engages in this thing and then it stops him from doing dhikr of Allah because of this wealth. So obviously this is a great harm of wealth. Now let's talk about the difference between a rich person and a poor person. Who is better? Is it a rich person who is grateful to Allah? Or is it a poor person who is patient? Who is better? In fact, the scholars, they have a difference of opinion. Some scholars, they say the rich person who's grateful is better. Why? Because, you know, he has access to more sins and therefore, you know, then he has to be patient as well. And so if he's grateful, then Allah will reward him more. Other people say, no, the poor person is better. Why? Because even though he's in this state of poverty, he could go and steal and things like that, but he doesn't steal. So this person, he's still patient and he is better. But in reality, the stronger view among the views of the scholars is that they are both the same. There is no difference between the rich person and the poor person with regards to the wealth. How can what Allah has decreed for you, i.e. wealth, Allah is the one who's decreed whether you're rich or poor. How can that then be a reason for you, something that's out of your control, whether you're rich or poor? How can that be a reason for you to be more honorable or less honorable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the richness and the poorness is not in and of itself a reason to be better or worse. But it is the amount of gratitude or patience that a person displays that is the deciding factor. So a person could be rich and he is extremely grateful and so he's better than the poor person. Or a person could be poor but he's extremely patient and he's even still grateful for what he has and he could be better than the rich person. So it doesn't matter how much wealth you have, it depends on how much you are thankful to Allah, how much gratitude you have towards Allah and how much patience you have. And it goes to show that even a rich person must show patience because he has to be patient against sins, for example. Patiently persevere upon obedience to Allah. Likewise, if he loses his wealth, he has to be patient. And the poor person must also be grateful to Allah, grateful that he's alive, grateful that he's upon Iman and Islam, grateful that maybe Allah has given him eyes, nose, lips, you know, hands, feet, and so on and so forth. So how can we fight against the extreme love of this world, the extreme greed, which is haram, or the excessive love for wealth? This is what is haram. To have wealth is not haram. In fact, in some cases, it's praiseworthy to acquire wealth. But the point here is the extreme love of this world. How can we fight this? We should have wealth in our hands not in our hearts. Let me repeat that. We should have wealth in our hands, but not in our hearts. You can have an expensive car, expensive garment, a nice beautiful house, that's fine. Sulaiman was very rich. However, this wealth should be in your hands, but don't love it with your heart. In fact, a poor person could have a greater love of wealth than a rich person. Why? Because the wealth is in his heart even though it may not be in his hand. He is extremely desiring of this wealth. So how can we fight this? Number one, we must aspire for economy, even whether we are rich or poor. The Prophet ﷺ said, there are three things that save a person. Fear of Allah in public and in private. Being economical when rich or poor, and justice when pleased or angry. And this hadith is reported by Bazaar. So three things, fear of Allah in public and in private, being economical when rich or poor, and having justice when pleased or angry. And this shows us the importance of having wealth in your hand. But subhanAllah, what we do is we have the opposite. We have the deen in our hands playing with it, 
and we have the wealth in our hearts. This should not be the case. We should not have the religion of Islam in our hands playing with it. We should have the wealth in our hands, but we should have the deen in our hearts. And so if one day the wealth disappears from us, then we should still be grateful to Allah. SubhanAllah, Allah gave me wealth and I was able to use it for so much time. But now Allah has taken it and we make dua that Allah gives us wealth back. Number two, we should have a firm belief in Allah's predestination. We should recognize that whatever Allah has decreed for us, we will not die until we get that. Whether you get that from a halal way or a haram way, if He's decreed it for you, it will come to you. You will not be able to die. Your life will not be taken until every single thing that Allah has already decreed for you comes to you. And then and only then will you be able to pass from this world. So if you try and get that from a haram way, it was still decreed for you. If you get it from a halal way, it was still decreed for you. If you didn't get it, then it was not decreed for you no matter what you tried to do. So therefore, understand, have full iman and yaqeen, certainty in Allah's decree. That whatever He's decreed will come for you. So therefore, you may as well spend the time trying to acquire wealth in a halal way, not in a haram way. And you shouldn't have extreme love of it. If it's decreed for you, it will come. If it's not decreed for you, it will not come. Number three, we should be content. We should realize the honor of independence and look at the humiliation of materialism and greed. If we just have great materialism, like we're continuously chasing after wealth, you know, subhanAllah, you should realize that it becomes humiliating. People will see you. But as for a person who may not have much wealth, but he is independent. He is honorable in the sight of Allah. He does not put his hand like this, but he gives from whatever he has, even if it's small. And the Prophet ﷺ said, giving charity never decreases wealth. So the more you give charity, the more wealth will come back to you. In fact, one of the early Muslim scholars, or many people, they used to say that whenever we needed money, we would give charity. SubhanAllah, they would give charity. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then give you more back. The next matter to cure ourselves from this extreme love of this world is to reflect over the life of the righteous people and to reflect over the lives of the disbelievers. So if somebody looks at the lives of the companions and the prophets, he will see what noble, righteous lives they lived and how they had great endings. And if you look also at the lives of the evil people like Qarun, for example, he was rich but arrogant and he was haughty. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the earth to swallow him up because of his arrogance. So one should only look at people who are lower than them in this dunya, who have less than you in the dunya. And this will make it easy for you to be thankful and grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in summary, wealth in and of itself is not something good, is not something bad. It is a tool to do good or to do bad. If we use it to do good, it will be good for us. And if we use it to do bad, it will be bad for us. And the same way about how we acquire it, whether we show off, how we spend it, and so on. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent O oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent O oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy on, our on our souls Obey your Lord, submit to Him